Horses were very important in the Civil War and were considered the backbone of it all. They moved guns and ambulances, carried generals and messages, and usually gave it all that they had. The total number of horses and mules killed during the Civil War mounts up to more than one million. In the beginning of the war, more horses were being killed than men. The number of horses killed at the Battle of Gettysburg totaled around 1,500, the Union having lost 881 and the Confederacy having lost 619. Horses were always working, whether it was plodding through dust, struggling through the mud, rushing up to a position at a gallop, or creeping backward in a fighting withdrawal. They always did what they had to do. They served their masters. At the start of the war, the northern states had approximately 3.4 million horses, while there were only 1.7 million in the south. Missouri and Kentucky had an additional 800,000. During the course of the war, the north used over 825,000 horses, the average price of a horse being around $150. The north had many chances to steal southern horses, and they did just that, since most of the fighting was on southern soil. The south did have chances to steal Union horses during Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania, but it was small compared to the thousands taken by the North. The armies often stole horses from enemy allies as well, just for the purpose to deprive the enemy of animals. Early in the war, the Southern cavalry was superior, mainly because of the lack of roads in the South, so the men had been riding horses since they were boys. But in the North, there were roads, so the people had been mainly riding in wheel vehicles. Long before the war, men in the South joined together to form mounted militia. Even though it was probably more social than warlike, it still taught them how to drill, ride daringly, and charge with the saber. Southern cavalry horses were superior to the Norse draft horses, mainly because of their fleet-footed, tall, skinny build-up. This is due to the fact that in the South, there was a racetrack for horse racing in just about every town. The different breeds used in the South were mainly the Tennessee Walker and the American Saddlebred, due to the fact that their gates were smooth and comfortable to ride, and they had tremendous endurance. Horses in the North were mostly carriage or riding horses, since no breed was bred in the North. Horses on the battlefield were usually 16 to 17 hands high and one hand equals 4 inches. They had to be about 5 to 7 years old and have good teeth and feet. Selected horses were brought to a boot camp to shape up for war. They were taught various commands and cues from a rider. One exercise is when a horse was given a verbal and physical command, they would lie down and stay down so the rider wouldn't get hit by passing bullets. The artillery and saddle horses used in battle had to endure ample danger. These horses were hard to kill as they fought and could take a lot of pain. However, the majority of horses killed was from disease and exhaustion. A single horse could pull up to 3,000 pounds over 20 to 23 miles. Some pulled more than others, however. Generals rode horses for the most part. This was because they were to be considered better than an everyday soldier. Plus, they gained height, and this enabled them to see their men in battle easier. Load the cannon! Wait, they're not positioned right. Go move them to the west. Oh, come on. We must get them out of here. We can't move it without the horses. It's too Bring heavy. The horse.
Since so many horses were used in the army, you can imagine the feed needed. The average ration was 14 pounds of hay and 12 pounds of grain, which was usually corn, oats, or barley per horse. The grain and hay needed varied day to day because the horses needed to eat every day, even when the army stopped. Horses could sit in the same spot for weeks, but eat thousands of pounds of hay. In addition to the artillery horses, cavalry, and horses and mules used to pull supply wagons and ambulances, there were thousands of saddle horses carrying officers and generals. 800,000 pounds of forage and grain were needed daily to feed horses and mules, but food didn't always come. A wagon held one ton, so 400 wagons were needed daily. There were severe shortages of hay and grain caused by opposing forces picking the areas clean. Other times, the hay and grain simply couldn't be delivered. In May 1864, the Union V Corps horses were living on five pounds of grain, but this was due to a lack of wagons since most of them were being used for ambulances. Pasturage was sometimes available, but green grass and field plants were not sufficient foods. 80 pounds of pasturage was needed to match the nutrition level of 26 pounds of hay and grain. Green grass could cause founder, a disease that cripples a horse's feet. Pasturage was used widely as either the primary source of food for short periods of time or a supplement when hay and grain were not available. Water for the horses was a dilemma. In camp, a battery could find the nearest pond or lake and water their horses routinely there. On the march, water was available at the end of the day, if possible. If water was far away, they would send half the horses to get it at once. If an emergency came about, the battery was at a terrible disadvantage because without horses, gun usage was impossible. You know, we don't have enough food for the 200 horses we have here. This is all we have left. Do you think we should graze? It really, really lacks the nutritional value. They're going to be slow and dull in battle. I don't think we have much of a choice. General George McClellan devised his own saddle from a Hungarian model that he saw when he went to Europe. The saddle was cheaper than most. However, it was still light enough that it wouldn't burden the horse, yet sturdy enough so that it could still hold the soldier's heavy loads. The saddle had a rawhide covered open seat, thick leather skirt, wooden stirrups, and a girth made of woolen yarn. The saddles also include a nose bag for feeding, a curry comb for grooming, a lara and a picket to hold the horse while grazing saddle bags, and a thimble that held the muscle of the cavalry men's turban. The saddle was set on top of shabrack, saddle cloth, or a saddle blanket. Half a million McClellan saddles were made between 1861 and 1865. The saddle became the Confederate-issued saddle in 1863 after the Jennifer saddle became too painful on their horses' bony bodies. You know, I don't think this Jennifer saddle is really working out. It's way too bo bony on the horses' backs. I know, I think we should switch the McClellan saddle. But it's going to be really hard to switch something made by the North. Yeah, but I think it's best for us Confederates. We're going to have to make do. Civil War horses have earned rights to recognition and reward for their service to our country. Many have become famous and have been remembered throughout time. Each general had a favorite mount that was, that was entitled to lots of corn and fodder, careful grooming, and a name. Part of the surrender terms in 1865 said that war horses could come home with their generals. A famous horse named Cincinnati was the favorite horse of General Ulysses S. Grant. While Grant was visiting his ill son, a man that was very ill and could not ride his horse anymore, approached Grant and asked him to take care of the horse. There was one condition. Neither Grant nor anyone else could harm the horse. Grant readily agreed and named the horse Cincinnati. Grant once said that Cincinnati was the finest horse I've ever seen. Cincinnati was 18 hands tall and descended from Lexington, a record-breaking thoroughbred of the time. Grant was once offered $100,000 for Cincinnati, but the offer was declined. Grant only allowed a small number of people, other than himself, to ride Cincinnati, one of which being President Lincoln. When Grant became president, Cincinnati moved to the White House with him. So who are you going to ride today, General Grant? Hmm. I think I'll stick with my favorite, Cincinnati.
Yeah, but I think it's for the best of the union. I mean, I'm not Confederate. I said union. <laughs> I like it's gonna be best for us butternuts. <laughs> Do you think we should grade them? I just love you, my fam. You're like this. Ooh. <laughs>